I'd like for you to open your Bibles up with me to uh, the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 4. Genesis, chapter 4. Genesis, chapter 4. Oh, what I would call uh, this message today would be first fruits, first fruits. When you look down here at the altar and you see the, the fruits of the harvest, well, actually, they're plastic. But it reminds you that those are some big pumpkins, right? They're big pumpkins. And uh, God likes big pumpkins. He likes the best. He likes the first because he's number one. So if I give this message a, a, a title, it would be First Fruits. Everybody say First Fruits. First Fruits. And usually Thanksgiving time um, is right after harvest. And uh, it's when they gathered in, traditionally in agricultural economies, the first fruits of the harvest, whether it was barley or wheat, uh, whether it was flax, um, whatever it was that they grew, that the sun, summer gave forth, um, it was in the harvest that they reaped. Um, and they had sheaves, like the sheaf that you see here in the middle of the altar. This sheaf, they would, how many remember those movies where they stacked them all over the field? Or maybe you came out of that type of uh, culture that still uh, works like that. Where they, now the, the bales are different. I remember when I was a kid, the bales were square for the most part. Now, have you seen the round bales? These big, huge round bales out in the countryside. Um, but this is a, a sheaf. Uh, and so it reminds us of the people of Israel that were taught uh, throughout their history to bring their first and their best. Everybody say first and best. Their first and best to God. First and best to God, which is called the first fruits. The first fruits. In other words, as a believer, you bring to God your first and best as an offering, as tithes. And as an offering, you bring to God your first and best. You bring to God the cream of the crop. Has anybody ever heard that saying, cream of the crop? Uh, in other words, that means you don't eat the cream of the crop, but you bring to God the cream of the crop, and then you eat the rest. Some folks have it backwards. They eat the cream of the crop first, and then they bring God your leftovers. Um, what does that mean? We'll find out what that means. Basically, what it means is that um, even though you may come to church or even though you may be religious and you're out there in the world and you don't bring your best and your first to God, but you eat the first and the best and give the leftovers to God, that means that God's not first in your life, even if you come to church. Even if you get up and give something in both offerings and you walk up to the music and you don't give God his portion, what belongs to God, it means that to you, God is not first. To you, you are first. And uh, the Bible has something to say about this attitude of people that uh, come to God but don't give him the first fruits of their Social Security check, the first fruits of their uh, unemployment check, the first fruits of their payroll check, the first fruits of the uh, suit that they want in court, uh, uh, the first fruits of their retirement. There's no free lunch for God. And so what I'm talking about today is giving God your first and best. Everybody say first and best Amen. belongs to God. So let's read this story in chapter 4 of the book of Genesis. Are you there? Amen. And it says this, and Adam knew Eve, his wife. Well, you know that the old fashioned word for new is that they're going to have a baby. And um, she conceived and went into labor and she had Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And again, bear his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So in other words, keeper of sheep, that is a pastoral economy and uh, tilling of the ground. That was an agricultural type of economy that they both represented. Um, and in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain, the oldest, brought of the fruit of the ground, an offering unto the Lord. I want you to notice something about what he brought. You might say he brought an offering. You say, that's awesome. But what, what is the offering qualified by any positive adjective? No. He said that he just brought a what? An offering. 
and offering uh, to the Lord. Keep that in mind. And uh, in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat of it. And the Lord accepted. That's another word for respect. Some of you had the word respect there. Uh, the word is actually accept or receive. You might even say the Lord was pleased. Okay. The Lord was pleased unto Abel and to his offering. Now, did anybody know the, notice the qualifiers or the modifiers that came before the offering that Abel brought? What is it? First. What else? The fat. Right? Do you know that the fat is the Lord's? That's why I'm the Lord's. And the scripture says, the fat is the Lord, so I'm fine just the way I am. Somebody say amen. amen. Now, we live in a thin and skinny, mottled culture. But just remember, the Lord loves the fat. Okay. Now, you know, I kind of like chuckle with all these churches. They don't know what to preach about, so they're on cookie diets and the Daniel diet and the Ezekiel diet. The Ezekiel is the one that cracks me up because, like, Ezekiel, like, Pastor, let me, let me get you a book on the Ezekiel diet. Well, what's it all about? It's, it's about Ezekiel bread. I go, well, did you know what Ezekiel made his bread? God told Ezekiel to make that bread with cow poo poo? No. He said, yeah, get dry road apples and make your bread out of it. Now, is your bread made out of road apples? Well, no, I got it at Trader Joe's. That's not an Ezekiel diet. So much and so forth, you know. Now, oh, heard a pastor, big famous pastor in Texas, was on a cookie diet. Anybody heard of the cookies? It was a cookie diet. He was every, everybody was being scolded for not eating the cookies and buying the cookies. I guess you get one cookie for breakfast, one at lunch, and one for dinner, and 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 a, and a shake. But that, that's not what I'm talking about today. That's just to lighten up the responsibility here. Five. Uh, but to Cain and to his offering, verse 5 says, he had no respect. In other words, that mean that, doesn't mean that God was angry with it. It doesn't mean that God uh, chastised Cain for it. The real word is God was not pleased by it. You follow me? Have you got a present that you were pleased with and another one that you weren't pleased with because um, it was actually a gift that someone gave someone else for two Christmases ago? Um, anyway, what I'm saying is this. Some things please God and some don't. So it's not a question of God didn't respect it as such as he hated what Cain brought. He did not. We'll find out why he didn't like it. Verse 6, and the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Okay, and it says 5, and Cain was very angry. Does everybody see that? And his countenance fell. In other words, he got a bad attitude against God, Adam, Eve, his brother Abel, and everything that that worship service was all about because God outed him in front of the whole family. The whole family was gathered around that worship service. Adam and Eve learned how to worship God and how to give God because God walked with him and talked with him and taught him what worship meant in the garden. So that Adam and Eve passed on the legacy of giving offerings and tithes to God to Cain and to Abel so that they were responsible for knowing how to bring something to God and Cain did not bring it to God the way God expected it and the way God taught Adam and Eve to teach him to bring it. Is everybody listening? We're going into the word. Getting deep into the word. So in other words, they just didn't have an altar there and they just showed up and Cain brought his offering out of nowhere, and then Abel brought a random lamb to God out of nowhere. No, the word, the idea that we find here in this verse that says here in verse 3, and in the process of time. Does everybody see that in verse 3? Do you see? Come on, somebody say something. Do you see that in verse 3? Now, I want this to be an educated church. Do you see it in verse 3? It says, and in the process of time, which means this, 
that the idea of worship, offerings, and sacrifices brought to God was not a one-time occurrence. It happened dur during a process of events of praise and worship. Does everybody follow? That's the Hebrew notion. That it was a habit that this family had since Cain was little and since Abel was little. Since they were babies. Like some of us bring our kids to church since they were babies. They know about God. They love God. They know how to give offerings to God. I get a kick out of all those little envelopes that come out of uh, children's church that have my grandson's name scrawled on it with a lead pencil. Elisha. And there's his tithes and offerings. I get a kick out of that because he's learning that from his mother and father who learned it from their mother and father. Boomi learned it from Mo. Josh learned it from me. Is everybody listening? So in other words, same thing with Adam, Adam, uh, Cain and Abel. It wasn't just a random offering. They were taught to give. They were taught how to give. They were taught why to give. They were taught who to give it to and when. Is everybody listening? Got that straight. So that's what that phrase means in the process of time. It means it was a habitual, uh, chronological event. And uh, it says that God uh, did not accept Cain's offering, uh, but unto Cain and his offering he had no respect. And Cain was very, very angry, and his countenance fell. So in other words, he developed a bad attitude. Why? Do you think his attitude changed negatively to hate and to bitterness against God and Adam and Eve and his little brother because God didn't accept his vegetables? Do you think that it was because God rejected his vegetables? No, it says Cain brought very good stuff to God. Maybe not his best. Maybe. What, what, what was the difference there in the way that that, that that happened? Basically, it was God was rejecting Cain's attitude. Everybody listening? So he was, not re he was not rejecting his offering. He was rejecting what? Because his attitude was not an attitude of faith. His attitude was an attitude of sin. Everybody listening? We read in Hebrews 11, verse 4, that it says, And by faith, Abel brought God a more excellent offering. And God credited it to him unto faith. So there's two ways to bring tithes and offerings to God. The way of selfishness, which means that it's really not your first and best, which means you already ate the first fruits of the barley. You already ate the first ribeye. You already spent it on a cologne at, at Macy's. You already bought the car with it. You already put the down before you even brought it to the sanctuary to sanctify it, to hollow it, and to give it to God as your first fruits and as your best. Now what we brought to God is what? Now all the guilty don't want to say leftovers. Now, I'm not taking roll. I don't even know what you bring. I don't even look at it. My bookkeeper back there, she could tell you, I don't go in there and look, oh, hoo, 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 hoo. I don't even care. All I do is pray that we all bring it the right way. Now, you say, well, see, that's why I don't want to become a Christian and come to church. Stop that. In the history of anthropology, godless cultures, godless cultures had at the root of their ethics and morals sacrificing unto a deity. The Maya culture, the high priest, as perverted as it sounds, raised his first son to be the first athlete in the tribe, to be the greatest warrior in the tribe, and to go forth into battle. And during the great games of life and death, if his team won, he would sacrifice his son to Kukulkan. The champion was sacrificed. The champion was sacrificed in a moment of glory and ecstasy that only their perverted idea of God would receive. It was not too far away from what happened when Jesus went to the cross, that there was a king that sacrificed his first and best, his greatest offering, so that you and I might be forgiven of our sins and be redeemed and have life everlasting. God gave his first and best, 
and didn't hold it back. So why should you not give God your first and best? And why should you hold it back? Am I making my case clear? All right. Now some of you are getting a little nervous there. They say, Pastor, I, we, I didn't want to go there. I wanted to call the shots on what I give God. I wanted to call the shots on, on what God, no, no, you, if you want to be a person of faith, you could be moved by worship, you could cry, you could raise your hands, you could bless God all you want, but your offering is unacceptable to God. You can't separate heart from hand. You can't separate salvation from your wallet. What you give to God is an indication of the posture of your attitude to God. You follow where the test is? Is everybody listening where the test is? You've lived all your life being a selfish person. You lived all your life, everything for me, nothing out there. But the fact that you're here this morning means that you're on the right track to be a pleasing and acceptable offering unto God. You're not too far away. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and bitter and hateful? And why, why, are you, why are you making such a long face, dude? You're tripping on your chin. Why, why is this happening? And I want you to look at God's gentle, loving, encouraging words, soft-spoken words to Cain, this person that brought the unacceptable attitude offering to God. See, God wants him to change. God wants him to repent. God wants him to turn around. God wants Cain to know, hey, I'm a God of mercy. I'm a God of grace, man. It doesn't take too much for me to love what you're doing. And I want you to change. But see, here's something interesting that giving to God brings out the best and worst in you. It's like, Pop Warner Sports. Has anybody ever had kids in sports? Watch yourself and watch your kids and watch everything, man. That brings out the worst and the best in people in a minute. <laughs> Mama confessed something. Just last, oh, I have to say it. This last baseball, little league season, I don't know what the blue said to our team. We were losing anyway. But he said something. He made a bad call. And I lost. It was Saturday. It was right before church. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't have to preach that morning. Josh was on. I said something. I started talking about his home life. I, I must tell you, I told him, you know, oh, man, I don't even want to go on because the park director might be here today. And, and he just gave his heart to Jesus in spite of what I said. God bless him. And Blue turned around and looked at my whole family and said, you! I'm glad he didn't say pastor. <laughs> You're out of here. Man, I looked at him. I felt like Cain. <laughs> Me? Yeah, you. I said, but you? And I kept on going all the way across the street to Target talking back at him. There I was, man, the lonely pastor leaning against a lamppost across the street watching the game. <laughs> yeah, it was so embarrassing. But it brought out the cane in me. You know, all of us got a little cane walking around in there, amen? Can we admit to that? Man, so all the family, Rita included, start turning around taking pictures of me for Facebook. <laughs> the lonely pastor. But, you know, being from the hood and all, it, as soon as the blue got, you know, into three or four, I just walked across the street and sat back down again. All right, see what he says. Thank God he didn't turn around again. Never saw him back again. Mm. Well, park director's not here, okay. Pastor, that was my brother-in-law. Pacavala. <laughs> anyway. Back to the story. The Lord said to Cain, why are you that way? If you do well, he says, 
shall you not be accepted? And if you don't do well, sin lies at the door. And unto you shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Okay, now, you ought, you ought to understand this little phrase right here, and unto you shall be his desire, and you shall rule over him. Don't connect that with Cain and sin. Cain's never going to rule over sin. As Cain, Cain, sin got Cain by the throat, so that's not referring to Cain. Cain's not going to rule over sin, and, and sin is not going to be Cain's desire. This is just uh, uh, interlocution relative to Cain and Abel, which meant that if Cain was worried about that now since God accepted Abel's offering but not his offering, that now Abel wasn't going to be his baby brother anymore, wasn't going to listen to him anymore, wasn't going to respect him anymore, that that was false. That means don't even worry about that. He's still going to love you. He's still going to respect you. You're still going to be the big brother. Nobody's going to take your responsibility and your authority away as a big brother. You don't have to worry about in the midst of your jealousy. Is everybody that clear on that passage? Otherwise, that passage makes no sense when you read it. So it's referring to Cain and Abel. you got to remember that Cain raised Abel. That was his baby brother. They wrestled together. They played ball together. They threw rocks together. They chased rabbits together in the Garden of Eden or whatever was outside of it because they weren't allowed to go back in there. It was his baby brother. And Abel was, was I looked up to him like, you know, like Koba, when they were growing up, Koba worshipped the ground that Josh and David wa walked on. I mean, he couldn't figure out who he was. So he said, I'm playing baseball and football at the same time. And played it at Penn, and it was excellent in both sports, because he just looked up, he worshipped these guys. And they loved him. And it's the same relationship that Cain and Abel had together until the devil and sin got into Cain's heart. And he talked to his baby brother, and he goes, baby brother, come out into the field. I need to talk to you about something. And, and Abel was absolutely innocent and ignorant as to what was boiling up in Cain's heart. How many times has something happened to you? Somebody did something, that bitterness just boils up into your heart, and outside you look okay, but inside you can, you can hardly wait until you get even. you got to get rid of that. Because if you don't, sin lies at the door of your heart. Now, there's two things that lie at the door. One thing is faith. It could be lying at your doorstep, standing there waiting for you to choose that door. Or the other one is sin, lying there at that doorstep, waiting for you to decide on what kind of attitude you're going to have towards God and to others and yourself. Is everybody listening to me? Pay attention to me. This is the word of God. Now, you remember Hebrews said that Abel brought an offering by faith, right? And it was credited to him for righteousness because it was more excellent. So in other words, faith is more excellent than a life of sin, bitterness, and anger, and putting God second. See, when you put God second with the money you have, you can come in here to church and enjoy yourself and all. It's nice to come to church, but you're a liar. Because God's really not first. You're the worst kind of hypocrite there is. Now, I'm not telling you to stop coming to church, because it might be that next week we'll have five people. I'm just saying this is a good opportunity for us to get it straight with God. To get it straight between you and your Heavenly Father. Otherwise, there's a curse on you. A curse. Not a blessing. Now, we always hear about, oh, God's merciful, God's good, God's loving, but he's also a God of a curse. Does that mean that he just cursed you? No, that means that we bring a curse upon ourselves, depending on what attitude we have towards God and what we give to God is illustrative of that attitude. Everybody listening to me? All right. Does everybody get it so far? All right, here we go. Uh, and if you do well, see, God's trying to instruct, instruct Cain in verse 7. If you do well, won't you be accepted? And if you don't do well, sin lies at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Now, we'll separate that off from the verse because that relates to Abel and Cain. And uh, don't worry about Abel. You worry about pleasing God. 
How many of you want to please God? Just say amen, nod your head, raise your hands up. Right? What happens if you don't? Guess what? Your heart starts to harden the minute that you decided you were going to do it your way. The minute that you start saying, but I can't afford it. The minute that you start saying, but what am I going to do? The minute that you start saying, but that minute that you start saying that, it's not faith anymore. You follow me? Because you're not trusting God. You're trusting yourself. And being a Christian is all about trusting in Jesus. Give, putting God first in your life and then watch God create America in your life to provide the difference that you thought you'd never make. That's the first miracle that happens when someone gives their tithes to God. You realize that even though you put God first and you're second and it seems like you don't have enough, all of a sudden a fantastic miracle happens and God provides above and beyond what you gave and what you need. That's a miracle. Do you want to see that miracle in your life? Or you can have the opposite attitude. So I'm not going to let go of that. That's for sure. Well, then right there, that's the answer to your bitterness, to the reason why your family was going the way it is, went the way it was. You can change that. It doesn't have to be that way for your grandchildren. You can avoid that. You can decide to give God what belongs to God. Now watch this. Uh, verse 8, and Cain talked with Abel, his brother. Okay, here's the big shift right here. Do you think that Cain wanted to enter through the door of faith? question do you think that Cain even after God encouraged him mercifully talked to him gently come on Cain man look all you got to do is what I'm not even asking you to do what your brother Abel did parents don't ever compare your kids with each other don't do that well you should be like your brother and that no 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 please no that's not right well you know what I really love the way that your brother did it that your sister did it there why are you always the one to mess up me on don't ever say that. Don't compare them. God didn't compare them. God just said, if you do right. So what did God mean by if you do right? Take a step of faith. Walk through the door of faith. Put God first. Put Jesus first. Put the Holy Spirit first. Put your money where your mouth is. Didn't Jesus say, for where your heart is, there shall your treasure also be. In other words, if you're really truly committed passionately to God, your wallet is truly committed passionately to him. Missions, your church, your kids' programs. I want my church to be the best. You walk out and see that parking lot today? Yes. Doesn't it look nice? Yes. Your tithes and offerings. Do you like the little towers that I'm so proud of? I wish it was Notre Dame, but it's Notre nothing. For God. At least you could see it off the freeway. And I'm so proud. Aren't you proud of our little church? I mean, it's not a cathedral or anything, but hey, we bring our best and our first fruits to God. Those of us that do do that, we do that because God is first in our life. I receive two little checks every month from two little shut-in sisters, one that fell and broke her hip and can't come to church anymore. And every month, it's her tithe from a social security check and a little note. Pastor, I love you and I'm praying for you. And another little sister. Pastor, lo amo. Aquí están mis diezmos. Her husband Adolfo died. And she can't come, but she sends her a little gift. You know, God's calling us to put him first, isn't he? Cain talked to his brother Abel and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, his baby brother, he should have put baby brother there, and he killed him. And the Lord said to Cain, and, and look, the Lord is still kind to this guy. He said to Cain, I mean, you would expect the lightning to come down and just fry him. You know, after being the first murderer. What a horrible, disgusting, perverted piece of human trash is the person that does not put God first. That's all you are. That's all I am. And it's horrible to say that. But I'm saying that because God is so good to us. 
Has God been good to you? Let's why not be good to God? And, uh, and then look, his attitude just shifts right there from bringing this offering to God. His attitude shifts. God says to Cain, where is your brother Abel? And he said, I don't know. Am I his keeper? What a big, insolent, fat mouth. Now he's really walked through the door of sin. How could you tell by what he brought? Is everybody listening to me? That when you don't give God what belongs to him, you're opening up the door to the dimension of hell. And curse. But when you give God your best and your first fruits and the cream of the crop and not the leftovers, you're opening up another door, which is the door of faith. Come on, church. The door of faith. The door of faith. The door of faith. Which means what? Salvation, justification, righteousness, honor, blessing, prosperity, goodness, health, healing. Good job. More than you could use. Enough to give away. Loving your home. Good kids. That walk with God. Mom and dad, if you just came to know Jesus Christ, I encourage you to start now to give your tithes and your offerings. Don't let the devil take your blessing away from you.